some new faces. Um, I'm presenting today a work titled Finding Needles in Haystacks, Multiple Imputation Record Linkage Using Machine Learning. And this is a, a project that's co-authored with a pretty large team of researchers from the Census Bureau and the University of Michigan and now people at other institutions, including myself at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Um, so this is joint work with John Abau, Joel Abramowitz, Maggie Levenstein, Kristen McHugh, Trevor Laura Raghunathan, Ann Rogers, Matt Shapiro, Nadawasi, and Don Zinser. Um, and before I go on, a little bit of fine print, uh, or a lot of bit of fine print. So the fine print mostly says that nothing that I say today is endorsed by the Fed or the Census Bureau, and that all numerical results that I show you have been screened to prevent any um, inadvertent disclosure of confidential information. Okay, so um, let me start by talking a little bit about uh, the record linkage problem and the data sets that we are trying to link it in this project. Um, we're interested in enhancing the health and retirement study, which as some of you know, is a longitudinal survey that interviews Americans over the age of 50 every two years. And these data have been collected starting since 1992 um, by the University of Michigan. And this is a long running project. Um, what we're intending to do in this particular uh, exercise of record linkage is to add richer measures of employer and coworker characteristics to the HRS. Uh, and we're going to do this by matching our survey respondents to their employers in the census business register. And the census business register is like a giant electronic yellow pages that is a list of every establishment or every place of business in the United States. And what we're trying to do is to find the employers of our HRS respondents and the specific workplaces that they're attached to in the census business register. So this is slightly different than the conventional or a common record linkage problem where you're trying to find the same unit in two different data sets. Here, we're trying to find units that are related through employment in two different data sets. And, and the challenge here is that we lack a common unique identifier that would allow us to easily do this linkage. Uh, and so we're going to have to resort to some more complicated methodology, use some probabilistic linkage techniques. Uh, and what we think is particularly novel in our application is that we're going to allow for uncertainty in that record linkage procedure to propagate into any analysis that downstream users of the data set may want to do. And the way we're going to do that is to use multiple imputation techniques. So with this background behind, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the structure of the data. Um, so an interesting feature of the HRS is that 70% of respondents consent to have their information matched to Social Security Administration data on earnings and benefits. And, and you might say, well, OK, if, if you know that, why do you need to go through all this record linkage? Um, the reason is that although we have a very useful variable, which is the employer identification number, or the EIN, um, that particular variable is not sufficient to always form a one-to-one -one or deterministic match between a respondent and their employer or their place of work. So today being tax day, I can talk a little bit, give you one extra minute about what EINs are. So you could think when you get your W-2, it has all kinds of information about earnings uh, and it has an employer identification number on it. Now, if you get say two W-2s because you work for two different employers, you have two EINs. And when we go look at information for HRS respondents, they might have multiple EINs in a given year. We don't know which EIN we should attach to the information that they provide us in the survey about their main job of interest. So EINs are not always going to help us to resolve record linkage in a, in a simple way but they are going to help us for about 40% of the sample. So in 40% of cases, we can deterministically match an HRS respondent 
to a specific place of work in the business register. So that's really nice. And we can just put those cases away uh, and think about the remaining 60%. The re remaining 60% are kind of split into two buckets. We have EINs for about half of them. So about 30% we have EINs and the other half we don't. Uh, and so we need to come up with some way to do probabilistic record linkage, sometimes when we have EINs, sometimes when we don't have EINs. So here's kind of a schematic of what I just said. We have all our HRS respondents. We can deterministically link about 40% of them. The remaining 60%, we have some with EINs and some without. Now, what kind of targets are we matching? We're going to match to two different types of targets in the business register. The first is an establishment. So this is a specific place of work. It's an address. It's a location where the respondent goes to work. Um, there's a more broad level of linkage we can do, which is to an employer. So you might think an employer has many different business, many different establishments, and some applications may not require us to know about exactly where a respondent works, but we might want to know who they work for in general. Uh, and so these two types of targets are separately matched and we create two different record linkage files, one which is matching respondents to establishments, another that's matching them to employers. And all of our uh, analysis that I'm going to talk about, you can think about these two exercises as separate and they're not linked in any or nested in any way. Okay, so I'm going to get into the four different steps of uh, probabilistic record linkage that we do. Uh, and, and I'm just going to talk about them for a moment before I get into them in detail. So the first thing we're going to do is to confront uh, an issue of computation. So we have tens of thousands of HRS respondents, and we have millions of records in the business register. So if we think about pairing these two files together, we get very large numbers of, of pairs, and we need a way to reduce the dimensionality of that of that problem and consider kind of feasible sets of records to think about which ones are matches and which ones aren't. And to do that, we're going to resort to blocking. Uh, after we do that, we're going to conduct uh, some training. So here we're gonna take a subset of cases and look at them as humans and ascertain whether they're matches or not. So that, that exercise is gonna allow us to learn about what features in the data tell us whether a given pair is a match and what features tell us that it's not a match. Finally, we're gonna take that training data and then use it to estimate a model that predicts the probability that any given pair is a match or not. And the last step is to use those probabilities um, to construct an assignment of respondents either to establishments or to employers. And we're gonna use that uh, or do that with multiple imputation uh, to account for the uncertainty that's inherent in this record linkage exercise. So now I'm going to go through each of these four steps in some more detail. Okay, so the idea of blocking is to really reduce the number of pairs that we think about uh, as being viable candidates for any HRS respondent. Um, just for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to think about labeling or indexing HRS respondents by I and BR candidates or business register candidates by J. And what we're going to do is to first take all IJ pairs that share a common EIN. So these are, these are HRS respondents for whom we have EINs. And we can go and find in the business register all the establishments or employers that have the same EIN. And we're now looking at a much smaller subset of cases than the entire business register paired with all the HRS. So we, if we use EINs for blocking, we end up with approximately 400 candidates per respondent. So that's not huge. Uh, and it's quite conveniently sized for us to be able to think about which ones might be matches and which ones might not. When we don't have EINs, 
we have to resort to information that HRS respondents provide to us about the location of their workplace. So they might provide us a name and address, and we can take that information or a telephone number, and we can take that information and go and look for business register candidates that share a three-digit zip or an area code from the telephone number or a combination of a city and a state or the full 10-digit phone number, and then combine all of those potential candidate matches. And that's our set of viable candidates from which we need to select um, matches. Now, when we use location-based blocking, we have a much larger set of candidates from which to figure out which ones are matches and which ones aren't. So here, here we're looking at approximately 30,000 business register candidates per respondent, which is very large. And this is going to be something that we need to um, shrink. And we're going to do that in a principled way later. But uh, just want to make clear that when you use EINs, as you might expect, you can be pretty precise and, and narrow down the set of viable candidates. But when we don't have EINs, um, we have to think much harder about how to do that. OK, so the second step is, is, a, is an exercise in reviewing data and trying to figure out which cases are matches and which ones aren't. So what we're going to do here is separately for the cases where we have EINs and for the cases where we don't, we're going to draw a sample of blocked pairs. And this isn't going to be a random sample. It's going to overweight cases where we think we're likely to find true matches. That sample of approximately 1,000 blocked pairs is unlabeled. We don't know whether they're matches or not. What we do is go into the Census Research Data Center and look at information about these 1,000 blocked pairs and ascertain by comparing the names, addresses, phone numbers, survey respondents report of things like, how large is my workplace? What industry do I work in? Does my employer provide health or pension benefits? We compare that information to what's in the business register where we also see the name the address, the phone number, the size of the employer, what industry it's in. Um, we don't necessarily know if it provides health or pension benefits, um, but we can compare these kinds of these pieces of information and, and ascertain whether we're looking at what we think is a match or not. And if it's a match, we're going to score it with a one. And if it's not, we're going to leave it as a zero. And we're going to do this separately for employers and separately for establishments. Now, having done this, we have a data set where we know the outcome, and that's given by MIJ here. Uh, and we also have a rich set of variables that we can try to use to predict that outcome. So that's what we're going to turn to next. So we're going to fit these models. Um, where we have a bunch of predictors that are embedded in this vector x here in, the, in, in this function p. And what we're trying to do is to predict whether a particular pair is a match conditional on x. And we want to do this accounting for the fact that we have only a sample of training data. So what we're going to do is construct Bayesian bootstrap replicates of that training data. And each time we, we do that, we're going to estimate beta hat. And that's going to give us multiple estimates of beta hat. So each of these estimates of beta hat is telling us a little bit about the randomness in that P function. It's telling us how, how uncertain we are about fitting this function. Every time we, we redo the estimation, we get slightly different betas. We're going to use these betas when we multiply impute records. So I'm just going to kind of leave this as a placeholder for now so that you know that we have multiple estimates of the betas. But before we get to using them, I need to tell you a little bit more about um, how we estimate this model. So we have lots and lots of potential predictors and we need a way to figure out which ones are important and which ones aren't. So here we're going to turn to a machine learning algorithm or particularly the elastic net algorithm to select features in the data that are valuable for prediction. And we're going to do that by tuning our uh, model to maximize out of sample predictive performance. So we want our training data to be able to tell us how best to fit 
data that we haven't looked at yet and be able to tell us which of those pairs are going to be matches and which ones aren't, or what the probability is going to be that they're matches relative to not. Now, an important assumption that's embedded in this exercise is an ignorability assumption. So we're going to assume here that unobserved determinants of match status, the things that we can't see in our data, don't appreciably change our estimates of whether a particular pair is a match or not. Uh, and that's going to be important for MI inference later on. Um, whether it's true or not is not something we can prove, but it's important to just state that up front. Okay, I'm going to go through a little bit uh, of what kinds of predictors we use because we use a lot and we have a lot of information. This is particularly helpful to kind of give more credence to the ignorability assumption. And I'm going to go through and tell you kind of why you might think that's, that's viable here. So um, to start with, we, we kind of take the most obvious pieces of information that are the names and addresses that are reported uh, both by HRS respondents and what we see in the business register. And we convert those names and addresses into um, Jaro Winkler scores. So these are gonna be edit distances that convert the similarity between two strings into a score that ranges from zero to one. So the more similar two strings are, the closer the Jaro Winkler score is going to be to one. And we're going to convert that Jaro Winkler score even further into a cubic spline. So we're going to have way uh, more linearity in the uh, nonlinearity in the Jaro Winkler score uh, than if we had just entered it um, as a linear function. We do the same thing with addresses and the same thing with uh, EIN share of earnings. So here we've got um, when we have multiple. Um, excuse me a second. So when we have multiple uh, bins in which an individual might be a multiple employers, sorry, I had someone come to my office just now. Um, okay, so when we have cases where an individual works for multiple employers, we might think that some employers are more important than others. Uh, and the way we're going to ascertain which ones are most important is to say, if a respondent gets a lot of their earnings from a particular employer, that might be a good reason why you think that employer is more important. Um, similarly, if an employer is very large, we might think it's disproportionately likely to be employing an individual. So we've got these kinds of continuous variables and we can then interact them all to create a very rich set of complementarities. Uh, and all of that information is going to feed into our prediction function. In addition to lots of other information coming from the survey, for instance, we know the age of a respondent. We know how much they make every hour that they work. We know how long they've been attached to the job, how much education they have, a um, bunch of other information, for instance, what industry they work in, uh, whether it's the same as the industry of the match to which we paired them in the business register, what their occupation is. Importantly, we're also going to put in information that comes from the nature of their interview. So did they take their interview in English or in Spanish? Uh, did they do it in person or over the phone? This is actually, I'm going to show you later on, somewhat important um, in terms of our ability to link individuals. And then finally, we have a bunch of demographics and we're going to put all of those in as well. And what I'm showing you here are only selected variables. We actually have even more uh, and we just sort of throw them in like a kitchen sink uh, and then allow the elastic net to, to select predictors. Okay, so now that we've estimated this pretty rich model to predict match status, um, we're going to go ahead and think about how to use the outputs of that model to construct the, the record linkage. So to begin with, if we just think about cases where we have EIN, so these are a kind of neat set uh, of cases where we have only about 400 um, business register candidates per, per respondent. Um, we can compute these match probabilities starting with say the first Bayesian bootstrap replicate of the training data and then select or sample a match probability with, uh, with probability proportional to the estimated match probability. And that's gonna give us 
a particular uh, realization of a link between an HRS respondent and an establishment in the business register or an employer in the business register. And we, we might have just stopped over there and said, well, we're done. Um, if we did that, we wouldn't be accounting for the fact that there's a lot of uncertainty in this, in this process. And we could have done this sampling procedure again and realized the different match. So we're actually going to go ahead and do this repeatedly. Each time we draw the sample, we use a different beta hat. So we use beta hat one, that gives us implicate one. When we use beta hat two, that gives us implicate two. And going through all the way up to our M, capital M, different estimates of beta hat. And in, in practice, capital M is 10. Each time we get a, a new draw of, um, a, a, of a realization between an HRS respondent and their establishment or employer. Now, how do we conceive about um, what linkage uncertainty is in this, in this world? So you might think, uh, as an example, given where most of you are sitting, that out of the 10 different implicates, nine times out of 10, you're matched to the University of Michigan. And one time out of 10, you're matched to the University of Michigan Credit Union. Now, in that kind of case, you have a lot of concentration of the implicates on a single employer. And that's, that's a case where you have pretty low linkage uncertainty. Uh, there's not zero linkage uncertainty, and that's important for us to underscore is that we don't have, we're not saying that this is deterministic in any sense, but we're allowing there to be some variation across the implicates that's important because it's capturing both our kind of inherent in uncertainty about which one which one's the right match, but also the fact that these betas are indexing some degree of randomness in the function that we're using to estimate matches. Now, the opposite of this case that I just mentioned, you could have a lot of dispersion. So out of the 10 different implicates that a respondent is, is matched to, you might have all of them pointing at different establishments or employers. And that would be a case where there's a lot of linkage uncertainty. So you can have in our data, respondents for whom the, the implicates are very concentrated on a single employer or establishment and cases where the, the implicates are pretty dispersed across different establishments or employers. And, and, and this dispersion or concentration is kind of telling us how uncertain the linkage is. So far, so good. What we haven't talked about at all are the cases that we've got um, where we don't have EINs. So these are our cases that we, we might have thrown away to begin with and said, we have no hope of matching these, um, but we're trying to do our best here to, to get as much coverage as we can. So these are cases where we've blocked only on location specific information. And, and as I mentioned earlier, we have about 30,000 candidates per respondent here on average. And that's a huge number. Um, when we have that many candidates from which to select matches, there's a pretty high chance that we're going to pick the wrong one. Uh, and so we want to do something that is not completely off in terms of um, selecting matches, but is going to use the data as best as we can to improve our ability to select higher quality matches from the set of matches that we have. Uh, so there's kind of two competing objectives here. What, what we're trying to do is to say, from this pool of about 30,000 business register candidates, we know that a huge number of them are junk matches. But we need a smart way to throw away those junk matches. So the first thing that comes to one's mind is, well, we could come up with a probability threshold that if a, if a candidate matches below the threshold, we might just want to disregard it. If we do this, we can improve the precision or the share of respondents that are correctly linked because we're now sampling our implicates from a much smaller number of candidates. But when we do this, there's going to be certain HRS respondents for whom none of the candidates to which they're mapped are going to be um, below, or I'm, I'm sorry, above this match probability threshold. So essentially going to kill all the viable candidates for some 
respondents, and that's going to lower the number of respondents that we can actually match. So we have these two competing objectives, and we're going to try to, to balance these two competing objectives by choosing a threshold that gives us the best combination of a precision rate and a linkage rate. So we want to have high precision and a lot of the sample match, but we can't do both of them perfectly. So we're gonna trade them off using this particular objective function. So the higher we set the match probability threshold, the higher the potential precision rate is, but the fewer respondents we're going to completely match. So how do we, how, what does this look like in practice? Um, so let's, let's take a look. So this is actual data coming from our linkage exercise. So on the horizontal axis here, we have the fraction of the sample that's linked. So that goes from zero to one. You could link 100% of the sample, uh, which is great. And that's what you would like. Uh, the precision rate on the vertical axis goes from zero to one. You could match everybody correctly. That would be a precision rate of one. So you would really like to be in the Northeast corner of this graph. If you go about doing the, the record linkage in a naive sense, and by naive, I mean you set no probability threshold, but just sample implicates from the set of 30,000 candidates, then you end up in the situation that's shown at the solid uh, dot in the bottom right corner of the graph, where 100% of the sample is linked, but most, or if not all of those cases are incorrectly linked. So the, the precision rate is under 5%, the fraction linked is 100%. Uh, and you might think that's not so good. Um, so we can actually improve on that by slowly raising the, the match probability threshold. And when we raise the match probability threshold, we're moving up and to the left along this blue line. We're slowly moving up and to the left. Every time we tick up the match probability threshold a little bit, there's going to be a few HRS respondents that have no viable candidates that they can be linked to anymore because any candidate they had been linked to had a very low match prob very low estimated match probability. So the, those are lost. But the ones that do survive, we now have a much smaller set of candidates from which to draw our sample. And that's going to allow us to really concentrate the precision a lot more. And, and we can see that happening as we move up and to the left. So the precision goes up, the fraction length goes up, and then we stop at this hollow dot. Uh, and that's where our criterion function is minimized. So that dot is at to the northeast corner of this graph. Now, if we look at these data in terms of uh, numbers rather than pictures, um, just looking at the top panel here, we started with this naive world where we had a match probability threshold of zero and a link rate of one. We had a very low precision rate, only two and a half percent. And a big reason that was true is because we had about 30,000 candidates to select from. When we moved up along that blue line to the optimal match probability threshold, which we find to be about 0.4 for employer level linkage, the linkage rate drops to about 65%, but the precision jumps up a lot. So we get about almost 60% of respondents being correctly matched to their um, business register employer. And the, the reason that's happening is because we're able to really cull the set of candidates. So we reduce the number of candidates from 30,000 down to only 50. So most of those candidates that were in there um, were, were removed by, by, by applying this threshold. And that allows us to, to really improve the precision uh, uh, at the cost of some loss in the linkage rate. And so we could do conceivably the same thing uh, using establishment level data. And uh, I've shown that at the bottom here. Now, the question is, how did we actually go ahead and do this? Because it, this requires knowing something about which candidates are matches and which candidates aren't. And we didn't use the training data to do this. So a very valuable piece of information that we used to do this was our deterministically matched subsample of records. So we had uh, about 40% of our sample where we knew exactly which business register candidate was the right match for a respondent. Uh, 
we could block on these much coarser measures based on location, learn about uh, all of the all of the records that were non-matches, and then go ahead and determine match probability thresholds using this this data-driven technique that really allowed us to improve precision with some loss in linkage rate. So, so this was, you know, kind of the best we could do given the data we had. Uh, an important thing to note is that the optimal thresholds really reduce the amount of bias in our in our estimates of certain employer and establishment level characteristics. And I can show you that in this picture here. So if we look at the top left corner of this graph, uh, what we can see on the horizontal axis is true log employer size. So we know because we've deterministically matched a subset of respondents to their to their employers, we know how large those employers actually are. And if we then go ahead and bin that employer size into 20 equally sized bins and compare the true log employer size to the employer size we would have imputed if we didn't use any kinds of threshold, we see on the heart, on the vertical axis that we pretty much randomly match respondents to employers. So instead of landing those blue dots along the 45 degree line, we end up finding that we're kind of getting the average employer match to every respondent. When we improve or optimally adjust these thresholds, we find that we concentrate most of those blue dots along the 45 degree line, showing that we're quite accurately fitting the employer size distribution with uh, these these optimally selected probability thresholds. So this is an improvement in, in the quality of the, the imputed size, uh, at least at the level of an employer. If you look at the bottom two pictures, you can see the same type of exercise conducted at the establishment level. And here you see that um, in the left, the bottom left picture, again, if you just looked at establishment size uh, coming out of our record linkage procedure without any threshold, we'd be kind of randomly matching respondents to establishments. Uh, whereas if you use an optimally correct collected um, threshold, the lower tail at least, so the lower half of the establishment size distribution is kind of lining up on the 45 degree line. But as you move further out to the very largest establishments, we find that there's some error here. So. So we do pretty well, with, at least with respect to employers here, but, but somewhat less well with respect to establishments. All right, so I'm going to spend a minute talking a little bit about um, some of the costs of uh, having these probability thresholds because some part of our sample is not linked. Um, although we think that the linkage is a lot better, it's important to, to say something about the sample, the characteristics of the sample that we don't match. So here I've shown you two different columns, um, characteristics of the sample that's linked, and that's about 92% of HRS respondents. And the second column shows the non-linked subsample, and that's about 8% of HRS respondents. And again, here to not be linked means you didn't consent to SSA linkages, so we didn't have an EIN. And second to that, using our probabilistic record linkage procedure, none of the candidates that you were matched to had sufficient quality for us to be able to uh, use those candidates so they wouldn't survive the match probability thresholds that we constructed. So in terms of age, um, these two sets of individuals are quite comparable, but that's where, uh, that's about, at least in the, in the characteristics I'm showing you here, that's about where things end. Um, the non-linked subsample is, is much less likely to be white. Uh, it's much more likely to be Hispanic and foreign born, lower earning, and almost zero probability of working in the public sector. Um, what's notable is that a much higher share of individuals in the non-linked subsample take their interview in Spanish rather than English but uh, a comparable share of them do it in person. So in, term, it, in terms of um, the quality of the data that's re being returned by, by respondents, uh, we don't think that 
that's particularly driven by by whether the you know interview happened on the phone or not. Uh, but but other features of the types of jobs that workers match with uh, that potentially make it hard for us to find those uh, establishments or employers with with a high degree of uh, certainty in the business register. So this is something to note, uh, and, and we have kind of more details about about um, these characteristics in the paper. Okay, so this so far uh, is kind of a tour into all of the linkage that we have done. Uh, I want to end by talking, oh, I'm sorry, I have one more point to make. Um, so we have these 10 different implicates and you might, you might say, well, how do you use them or what do you do with them? How do you kind of aggregate them and think about constructing estimates of interest downstream? So here we're going to use or apply the, the Rubin combining formulas for multiple imputations. So for any parameter that you might be interested in, uh, it could be a regression coefficient or summary statistic. Uh, you could calculate that statistic in each of the 10 different combined data sets and then average those st statistics together to give you the, the overall parameter estimate. And the multiple imputation variance is going to be a combination of two different pieces. The first piece is going to be the within variability or the variability associated with each of those theta hats, so each of the estimates in each of the 10 different samples, and also the variability across the 10 different samples. And those can be combined using these formulas. So this is somewhat standard, um, but I just wanted to mention it uh, here. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to talk about is uh, an application uh, that shows um, how these data can be used to shed light on the nature of uh, household survey reporting error, particularly with respect to employer characteristics or establishment or workplace characteristics. And the way we're going to study this or kind of use um, an existing bit of literature to study this is to think about the fact that at, at least in economics there's this robust empirical finding that larger workplaces pay otherwise similar workers higher wages so we know that uh, there's this positive gradient between the size of the workplace that you're at and your your wage what we're going to show is that if you rely on survey reports of workplace size, this gradient is actually going to be amplified. And the reason is that survey reports of workplace size are subject to non-classical measurement error. And I'm going to show you that, um, and it's going to kind of pop off the, the page quite cleanly. OK, so what we're going to do is to conduct this kind of very simple econometric exercise of regressing log wages which are taken from the survey data and that's on the left hand side and regress that on the log of establishment size which could be either taken from what respondents tell us themselves or from what we infer from the business register so there's two different ways to measure log size uh, and we can also control for a bunch of features uh, which are kind of not important at this time, but we want this to be relatively similar to what folks have done in the past. So we, we want to try to compare similar workers, at least in terms of education and how long they've been on the job and other demographic characteristics. So that, that's all embedded in that vector W. So if you look at the top panel of this table, it's showing you estimates of gamma one. That's the wage size gradient um, in two different ways of, of reporting the right-hand variable. So if we rely on what respondents tell us, we see the, the gamma one estimate is 0.04. If we instead use size imputed from the business register, it's about half as big. So the first kind of take on this is, well, we, we normally think that survey responses are subject to measurement error and that's classical measurement error. And so that should cause attenuation bias in, in our estimates. And we actually see this going the other way. We see that respondents self-report of size is actually generating a larger coefficient than if we use size imputed from the business register. Now, this isn't just an artifact of our probabilistic record linkage procedure. 
If you look at the lower panel, we conduct exactly the same regression amongst the subset of respondents that we've deterministically linked to the business register. So there's no linkage uncertainty at all. And we see exactly the same pattern. We see in that subsample, self-report of establishment size generates about two times larger of a coefficient than if we use the exact administrative data on establishment size from the business register. Now, why does this happen? If we take a look at comparing establishment size reported by HRS respondents, which is shown in the vertical axis of these two graphs, and compare that to establishment size that is taken from the business register, which is shown on the horizontal axis of these two graphs, you'll see a pattern here that's uh, pretty telling. So in the left-hand picture, instead of having those blue dots line up on the 45 degree line, which would suggest there's no reporting error at all, we see that respondents employed at small establishments tend to over-report the size of the establishment and respondents employed at large establishments tend to under-report the size of the establishment. And this is generating a negative correlation between the true variable of interest um, and the measurement error. And again, this isn't just a feature of the probabilistically linked sample. It's true even amongst deterministically linked cases, which is in the right-hand side here. There's a negative relationship between the error and the true variable. And this is causing amplification bias rather than attenuation bias if you use survey data. Okay, so in summary, um, in this project, we use probabilistic record linkage to enhance the HRS with these rich measures of employer and establishment characteristics that come from the census business register. And through it, a whole set of um, business data that is maintained in the Census Bureau's RDC. Uh, a, an important feature of the data that, that we want to highlight is that um, we've done the record linkage in a way to incorporate uncertainty uh, through multiple imputation. And finally, I showed you this example that, that kind of highlights um, a feature of this, of this data, a benefit of this data is that it shows that household survey reports about employer and establishment characteristics can be kind of unreliable in, in some potentially important applications. And using these um, better matched data can help alleviate that issue. Speaking of applications, there are potentially many. Uh, we might want to use the NHRS to study how employers and workplaces transmit shocks, for example, trade exposure or firms merging, workers losing their jobs, other employer level changes that you might conceive of on individuals, labor supply decisions about when to retire, for example, or to switch jobs or to participate in different government programs like social security or disability, uh, how it influences their health and well-being, and um, potentially even as, as uh, far reaching as how um, different generations transfer resources between each other. These are all things you could use the HRS to study uh, and you can now do it uh, in the context of thinking about the employer's role in, in influencing these kinds of outcomes. Um, you might also want to think about risk references which are interesting, but also measured using nice survey metrics in the HRS and compare those to how workers sort into specific types of jobs. Um, and then another application potentially quite important is the role of commuting time, um, particularly given what we've seen happen over the last two years. That's uh, quite an important dimension of workers' decisions about whether to keep working or not. Um, so these are all possible applications with the data. Um, and I'm gonna stop at this point. I don't know if questions have come in because I haven't seen the chat, but um, I'm going to stop sharing at this moment. I don't see questions in the chat. People wanna just ask. I have a, yeah, so can, you, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so I have I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, one is about the independence of, of the exercise for establishment uh, 
and for employers, uh, I will assume that matching on employers give you information for the matching on on, on establishments, right? So I will. I, I'm not sure. I mean, what's the rationale for for not using that information? So that will be one question. And the other question has to do. I mean, if you could give me maybe some some comment on this alternative strategy that you can think of. So let's say that I only care about the, the exact identity of uh, employers or establishments is not really important for my project, but just the characteristic of like establishment sites, let's say, right? And so an alternative approach could be, you first do the deterministic matching on, on EIM with the 40% or 30% uh, cases that you have that, and then just use simple standard multiple imputation for those characteristics based on the first level. Uh, of matching, or a, a second alternative, you do the, the the deterministic imputation first. Second, you do the imputation where you can match on EIM, which is pretty straightforward. But instead of dropping a fraction uh, in the, for the third group, you go ahead again and do multiple imputation using both information for the deterministic matches and the information for the multiple imputation of the of the uh, of the second step. So what's the you see, this seems to be a possibility, but I assume there are, I can imagine advantage of doing the linking, for instance, if you want to link to other data sets. And so for you, it's very important to have the, the identity of the, of the establishment among you. But if you care only about this characteristic in your project, uh, how does, how will this different potential approaches compare? Yeah, so I can take a stab at answering the second question first, um, but I also open it to other co-authors who have thoughts on this. So I think one quite nice advantage of doing the imputation at the level uh, that we've done it is that the, the joint distribution of various characteristics of establishments or employers are inherited through the record linkage rather than being imputed one by one. So if you say, think about, if you care about size, you could do the exercise you mentioned that you could just impute that single variable off the information you know from the deterministically matched cases, but you might also want other things to uh, impute. Like you might wanna know about average wages, for instance, at the employer or some other feature of the employer, like what share of workers is under the age of 50 or something like this. And if you do it the way we've done it, um, then the kind of real distribution, the joint distribution of those variables is all inherited through the record linkage rather than being separately done. So that, that's potentially a valuable thing. Um, about this point on the nesting of employers and establishments, I think that's, that's valid. I think we did go through that uh, or think about that a little bit. So there's, it's, I think, a little bit more computationally involved because there's kind of two levels of randomness. So if we impute the, or, or kind of try to match the employer first, and then only think of within it, which establishments do we care about? We kind of have to think this, I think at like a sort of two, le two levels of modeling involved that is just more complicated. Uh, and so we didn't, we didn't go, go about doing that. Um, so this well, was the, simpler, but maybe not maybe not always as sharp. I mean, uh, regarding the second point, uh, you have an implicit imputation of of employers when you input establishment, right? You don't need can to do say, anything else. Can you say that again? I'm sorry, I didn't yeah. catch that. When you impute establishment, you have an implicitly an imputation of employers as well. So it's not. That's it's, correct. How can you be more complicated? Like okay, it's, no, so, it's a byproduct. No, that that is that is absolutely right. So if you start with establishments, you get employers for free. Uh, right. That's true. The employers that you get for free are not as good as the employers you would get if you started with employers, because matching at the level of an establishment is a harder exercise than matching at the level of an employer. Okay. And and regarding the first the first question that you address, so the usually met the at least sophisticated uh, approaches to multiple imputation at the level of variable, of course, care as well about the correlation about the variable they are imputing, right? So it, it seems to be an empirical question. 
whether this approach is better. I mean, nobody that the sophisticated multi imputation is going to impute variables independently without you know taking into account the, the other variables they are imputing. Uh, either they assume some uh, multivariate distribution or they do a chain imputation. I mean, everyone does. So, so it seems to be an empirical question. So do you get better results than using the standard approaches? I don't believe we've done that. Um, oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Matthew, go ahead. Yeah, we, yeah. Sorry for the echo, but we're also trying to create a general use product. So we don't want to have a predetermined list of variables to impute. We could, having a linkage would be useful to uh, using a census survey that hasn't even been conducted yet. That could be into the business register. So, uh, so given, given what we're trying to do, which is basically linked to everything that can be linked to the business register, imputing every conceivable variable also has a feasibility problem, uh, including variables that haven't been invented yet. Uh, can I comment on that? I mean, if you just have the deterministic matches and uh, you can allow the, I mean, basically if you provide deterministic matches, then the user can impute whatever variables they care about, right? But they, they could do that if they wanted, but the, the, I think the other problem yeah. Deterministic matches would be uh, they're a special case. They, right. they, they, those are single units in particular, single unit uh, right. terms, which are a very special subset of. So I'm not sure you want to generalize um, imputing all variables from them. Yeah, but that 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 also I think is a problem with sort of uh, doing the imputation for the non-linked cases because then you are making an assumption that distribution that is there for the deterministic linked cases are, are exactly same as for the non-linked cases, um, that is non-EIN cases. So I think that we wanted to use as much information as possible uh, on the linkages available to make the, make the, um, make this assess, make this imputation rather than relying only on the covariates, that might be quite different between the people with uh, EIN versus non-EIN. But your second point, I think is, is a good one. I think that we could do the imputation for those 8% of the cases that were not linked, uh, just using those, uh, the linked non-EIN linked cases because they are much more extendable and, and then, Missing a random assumption for those eight percent might be more valid, or we could use a weighting to weight the um, those ninety-two percent that were linked to compensate right. for the eight percent that were left out. Right. Darren, do you want to address the things in the chat? Okay. Oh, there's some stuff in the chat. Okay. Um, how to extend to the clustering mode? Um, okay. Um, can you expound on that? I'm not sure I understand what the clustering mode means. Let's say you have oh, one data. Say you have one data set that can have multiple matches in it. You know, you're trying to find all here, all records that are for reference. So you can't, you don't have one data set that you're matching against a bit, like a clean data set you're trying to evaluate. You have to go from pairwise to decide which of these pairwise records all go together. Does that make sense? Um, I didn't, no, I didn't quite follow that. I'm gonna to try to do, take your second question or you can come back to the first. So seems like having a blocking that had a better F measure than either EIN or location would give you a lot of leverage. Is that true? Yes. Uh, I don't know if such a variable exists, uh, but yes. So I think that's what my, my comment was. We did use phone numbers for there was a small fraction of, uh, of respondents for who, had who had given us the phone numbers for their employers. And those were actually very good for reducing the blockage though. Sometimes it was just, well, 
If it matched, it matched, and if it didn't, it was useless. <laughs> um, um, sorry. Thank you, Forrest. Thank you, Forrest. <laughs> I have a, a question if I can um, ask it. I'm so kind of returning to the um, objective function you use to choose the threshold for kind of, you know, only those those potential matches above that threshold. Um, so it, like my understanding is that you're just basically minimizing the distance up to the Northeast corner. And I'm curious if, is there is there any theory that talks about what else that might be optimal for? Like, I mean, like if you if you go back to like, you know, Fuligi Center, right? Then there is kind of a well developed, we're optimizing or we're minimizing the number of cases we have to manually label subject to some linkage error. And I'm curious if if there is a way you can kind of think about that or, or if in general you thought about other potential objectives to help you choose that optimal threshold. Yes. <clears throat> so in this case, I think one of the one feature that we had in mind was that when we're looking, when you're thinking about matching files where you're looking for the same kind of record in two files. So if we were say matching people to people to themselves, um, then you care, you care a lot more about, I think you care a lot more about recall than in the current case where we don't care so much that every potential business register candidate that is a true match was ultimately selected in the record linkage. We care much more about the fact that we have high precision. So we want all of our HRS respondents to be correctly matched. But if, if there is a few business register candidates out there that we didn't select, that's okay. So the, the main trade-off I think here was um, between some, I think sometimes this is done as a precision recall trade-off. Uh, we didn't kind of put any weight on recall at all in this exercise, mainly because the firm side or the kind of business register side of the information is, is not primarily what we're trying to match. We're trying to use it as a donor pool from which to get the matches. Um, So yeah, uh, that that's kind of all I've got to say about that. But we, but yeah, we haven't kind of tied it back to whether it maps to the Filagi Center like optimal cutoffs there, um, or the choice of those cutoffs, which was to reduce human training time. I think at the end of the day, um, yeah, yeah, we didn't we did not do that. But that's a that's a cool that's a cool question. Like I'm I'm wondering if like instead of just overlaying that objective, your objective is more maybe to like minimize the bias or the mean square error in your estimated statistics. And I don't know how easy it is, but kind of back out from that to see what kind of objective function that implies um, over that space. Because especially right now, you're, you're I mean, yeah, I, I take what you mean that you're looking at your linkage rate as opposed to recall, but it's treating precision and, and linkage rate the same right now. It's kind of agnostic. Yep. Um, and there could be gains in the specific situation based on the statistics yep. you're looking at that you might care more about one versus the other. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So there, so there's kind of an implicit, yes, we put equal weight on those two pieces. And depending on what you what outcome you care about, that, that's another tuning parameter you might want to select there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I think we're at time. Erin, can you just announce next week's, next month's? Yes, so next month, our presentation will be the last one of the semester on May 16th. And Trent Alexander and Katie Genetic will be presenting on the Decennial Census Digitization and Linkage Project. So hoping to see many of the same faces there next month. And thanks, Deren. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.